All right, well, welcome everybody to our second talk of this semester's um, Bellarmine Forum on Climate Change, Justice, and Health. Um, as noted last week, I'm Rachel Washburn, Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology and Director of the Health and Society Program. Um, and this semester, or this year, also directing the Bellarmine Forum. Um, as I noted last week, but I'll do it again, we might have some new people. Um, I'm, we're really grateful um, to the support of the BCLA Dean's Office, Ryan Yandel, Allison Mullen, and Abigail Davis, and um, Yun Jae Wang, uh, a colleague in Asian and Asian American Studies, um, provided a lot of really helpful um, feedback in developing the overarching structure for this year's series of talks over the summer. And I've also received an incredible amount of support from co my colleagues, Amy Woodson Bolton in history, Evelyn McDonald in journalism, Mona Seymour in urban and environmental studies, and Trevor Zink, who's in the Department of Management and also the director of the honors program. Um, all of those colleagues have generously served on a planning committee and provided a lot of really great ideas um, for topics and speakers for this year's series of events. Um, and Evelyn, has graciously helped to organize a few events, including helping out with this one that we're doing today. So before I do a, a welcome and sort of an intro for um, one of our speakers, at least, I'm gonna hand it over to Evelyn to do um, the other. Um, we want to acknowledge um, our presence um, on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva people and their neighbors whose ancestors ruled the area we now call Southern California for thousands of years. We pay respects to the members of elders from these communities, past and present, who remain stewards, caretakers, and advocates of these lands. Indigenous peoples of Southern California have survived three conquering regimes and still thrive today in an unbroken chain linking past to present. As we think together about climate change, justice, and health this semester, I hope we all gain a greater appreciation for the interlocking processes that continue to cause disruption, displacement, loss, and death in highly inequitable ways across species inhabiting the planet, both past and present. Today, our two presenters will discuss ways of making sense of climate change on a personal level and how we can move from fear and anxiety to action. Let the resistance and resilience of the Gabrielino and Tongva and their neighbors be in our hearts and minds as we sit with complexity and difficult feelings, hopefully moving towards action to reduce injustice, suffering, and loss. So it's my pleasure to welcome today's speakers, Dr. Sarah Jaquette Ray and Clara Buckley, who will be sharing insights about eco-grief and eco-anxiety and strategies for living with these feelings in, in productive ways. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Ray and then hand it over to Evelyn McDonald to introduce Carl Buckley. Um, so uh, without further ado, we're fortunate, really fortunate to be joined by uh, Dr. Sarah Jaquette Ray, who researches and teaches on environmental justice, climate activism, the environmental humanities and climate emotions at Humboldt State University and beyond. She's author of many articles and books, including The Ecological Other, Environmental Exclusion in American Culture, and the edited volumes Latinx Environmentalisms, Justice, Place, and the Decolonial, Critical Norths, Space, Theory, and Nature, and Disability Studies and the Environmental Humanities, just to name a few. She's done others, but I thought I would just highlight a couple. Um, Dr. Ray's most recent book, A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, How to Keep Your Cool on a Warming Planet, explores the role of emotions in climate justice activism, which we'll hear more about today. In addition to her scholarly work, Dr. Ray is engaged in a number of public projects to build emotional tools for climate justice. She's currently working on an edited collection for educators called An Existential Toolkit for Climate Justice Educators. She offers a climate wisdom lab workshop through Emergent Resilience, and speaks extensively on climate justice and emotions, and has written for the LA Times, The Scientific American, the Cairo Review of Global Affairs, Zocalo Public Square, and other venues. Um, so before handing over, handing things over to Evelyn McDonald, um, I do want to read a quick quote from Dr. Ray that I hope will speak to our undergraduates as we kind of, you know, have the have these series of have these two talks today, but also the, the series throughout the semester. Um, she notes that college education should not just be about learning content, 
but about all of the problems in the world. It also must provide an emotional awareness and skills to cope with witnessing and addressing those problems. Developing an imagination for alternative modes of living and having a stake in a transformed future are just as important as learning how bad things are in the present. So I will let um, my colleague Evelyn McDonald um, introduce um, Farah Buckley, and then I think we'll have Dr. Ray speak first, followed um, by Farah Buckley, and then we'll open things up to questions um, for both speakers. Um, as we did last time, feel free to put questions in the chat, but you can also raise your hand as well. Thank you so much, Rachel, and uh, everyone should understand what an amazing amount of work Rachel has been doing for this forum and what a great job she has done putting this together. So please, like, round of applause um, for, for Rachel. Thank you for this. Um, and it's my great pleasure to work my to introduce my esteemed colleague um, and dear friend Cara Buckley uh, to you all. Um, one of the things about being a journalist is that um, you have to be able to cover a variety of subjects, especially if you're working for a daily newspaper. You, you never really know what kind of breaking story you might get thrown on, um, and you have to be able to teach yourself quickly and nimbly um, and to have a broad education. Here we are, BCLA, let me give a plug for the humanities and liberal arts and the importance of, of being able to be nimble in your thoughts and know how to do critical thinking. Um, and Kara has uh, modeled this in her vaulted career. Here's some of the subjects she's uh, covered um, in her um, years of, of journalism. Um, she has covered multiple hurricanes as a reporter, not only for the uh, Miami Herald, but also in her current position at the New York Times. She covered Hurricane Sandy. She contributed to cover coverage of George Zimmerman's trial. She's been in Baghdad uh, covering the war in Iraq. Um, she, in Miami, she covered the Terry Schiavo case, if you remember that. She's written about Sarasota's Klein, Clown Wars, um, and Everglades Bigfoot in Miami. You get all kinds of weird stories. And um, she was a reporter on the Culture Desk um, for a few years. And as part of her work there, she was a member of the team that won a Pulitzer Prize for her reporting on workplace sexual harassment. Um, she has won other awards. She won a Sunshine State Award at the Miami Herald for coverage of Hurricane Ivan. Um, uh, she covered the Latin music industry at the Miami Herald. And actually, I worked. that's how I first came to know her. And we worked on a, a series of stories there that also won a, a SPJ Award, I think, um, in Florida. So um, she is uh, really someone who has... Um, just had a really interesting career. I'm looking forward to the day she writes her memoirs. Um, right now, she is a climate reporter for the New York Times who focuses on people working toward solutions and off the beaten path trails about responses to the crisis. So please welcome Cara. She'll be speaking after um, Professor Ray. Should I just get started then, Rachel? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank sorry, you. thanks, thanks, Dr. Ray. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, and thanks, um, thanks to Rachel, thanks to LMU for having me, and all of you for getting on Zoom again to do something like this. And um, I'm just astonished, and I hope I honor uh, your time and attention by saying something, any one thing maybe that could be useful to you, and the thinking that you're doing about what you're doing as a college student, what you're doing on this planet. Um, all of these things come from my own sense that college has been, was a time for me anyway, and that's why I wanted to become a professor, that college is sort of a, a pivotal moment in a person's life. As a person from a sort of Anglo-Western background, I didn't have any sort of rites of passage or anything that marked my own course of life, but college felt like that for me, as close as I could get to that, where you're really coming to out of the shell of your family and where you grew up. And I'm from Los Angeles originally, actually. Um, and I went to college in Philadelphia. So it was a real shift of, of place for me. And I learned the exposure to new ideas and the exposure to this opportunity to invent or rediscover myself was just a real existential moment. And I really love that about college students. And then of course, you know, the way I was trained in, in my degree and the way I was taught by professors, um, 
it was very much about the content. We had the luxury of focusing on content. <laughs> in a COVID moment, I sort of feel like who has the luxury to just talk about big questions and intellectual stuff and learn content? We are just like surviving now. Um, so this was a moment, I went to college and graduate school at a time when um, we could really get our teeth stuck into uh, issues of the time and figure out the best tools to address them. And um, one of the things that I spent a PhD doing in environmental studies was learning all of the ways to try to use culture, text, literature, um, advertisements, whatever, to get people to do more pro-environmental and pro-social behavior. And I was in this sort of field, you know, era of people in environmental studies where getting people to care more was the kind of primary uh, agenda and the primary purpose of anything that we were thinking about. And I think um, most people who are in the environmental education field who went through education at the same time or in my generation still teach from that perspective that getting students to care more about problems is still the agenda. And my understanding of that being an outmoded agenda came about six or seven years ago when I started to realize that fire hosing bad information and terrible case studies of students to get them to wake up to how bad things are and how interconnected social justice and environmental problems are was actually backfiring. And my students were actually getting apathetic with the overwhelm. And does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> Right, this was happening to my students. I think of them as kind of canaries in the coal mine uh, prior to the 2016 US presidential election and their emotional or what I call existential grappling with what it was like to come of age at the end of the world, which is how it felt to them. And frankly, I was going to college in a time when planetary collapse was not knocking on our door, you know, so I was I also didn't have the same planetary conditions to, to be coming of age in. So the moment that we're in, the moment that young people and students are in has changed. The, the requirements of what environmental education should be for, um, in college is we're in a different moment. And so right, right after the 2016 US presidential election, I had this kind of crisis of purpose. Uh, what is it that an environmental humanist with a bent in justice was gonna do in this moment after um, once uh, you know Trump was elected because from my perspective there was nothing good that can happen for climate justice which was what I cared about with with what he did to the EPA and what he did to climate not to mention to questions of racial and social justice and so we, my students and I up here at Humboldt State which literally as of today about two hours ago we have a new name we're called Cal Poly Humboldt so this is my first time you know, coming to you all as Cal Poly Humboldt professor, I got to get my head around that. Um, yay. Um, but there was a sort of real moment of reckoning around what was going to what was supposed to be uh, an environmental education in a moment of um, a real crisis. And then COVID happened. And then the wildfires in California happened. And so the unfolding sense of turbulence and crisis is now the norm. And so I, I my argument is and 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 I don't I'm not saying I've perfected it, but uh, educators are, are, are it's incumbent upon educators to uh, um, come to students and come to their purpose on the, uh, in the classroom with a real different set of tools. And so I spent a lot of my time with actual educators trying to think through what are the insights from my book and my research around climate emotions and climate justice emotions and the role of emotions in social justice movements. What does that mean for the classroom? So that's one of the questions that really drives me. Um, this was a shift in direction from my, my research before, which was environmental justice. And I there are some ways that those things overlap with the question of emotions that I think are pretty exciting. I hope to share some of that with you today. But um, you can see that in this moment, my, my research really shifted towards um, instead of the content, you know, when we write syllabi for students, we think about all the stuff we've learned in our PhD and how we want to jam it in there and teach all the students the stuff. And, you know, we write these sort of outcomes on our syllabi. I don't know if students even pay attention to these, but these are, you know, important for professors and administrators. What are the things that students will have checked off their list and we can test and assess them for and prove that we're doing our job and get the accreditors to keep making sure we're okay. So that's how it feels like from a professor's standpoint. But those outcomes, if we look at our outcomes of our syllabi, if you picked up your syllabus right now for the class that you're in, I'm not sure, I'm going to guess, maybe I'm wrong, but not many of those outcomes have to do with emotional or psychological skills that uh, the planetary crises and the, and the racial justice crises and the democracy crises and all these things that are going on, not to mention COVID, um, will, are requiring of you. 
the last two years, have you developed any emotional existential skills through just the, the turbulence of being alive in this moment that maybe you're wishing that you maybe had learned in college even before these things happened? And so there's a real um, vacuum there around what are the emotional tools that we need, not just students, but we all need to show up for the moments that are that are with us now and are certainly going to be ahead of us for the long term. And so I started to think, well, what what would be, let me go research what the emotional like skills and the emotional states and the which emotions are the ones that will leverage the most long-term stamina and engagement in climate justice advocacy. Because what I'm seeing around me is students who are so despairing, so grieving, so alone, so apathetic now to the point of nihilism, right? Like, you know, really feeling like they can't even come to class because they're so upset about what they see around them and what's going on. That's certainly not going to do them any good. It's not going to do our colleges and our programs any good because we're supposed to retain and graduate students, right? And it's certainly not going to produce what we claim in all of our brochures as all these great citizen leaders out in the world making all this change happen for the betterment of society or whatever. So that kind of premise of what college was supposed to do and produce in students was just crumbling before my eyes. And I thought this isn't this is an emotional challenge. This is a cultural challenge. And um, that's what turned my research to, towards thinking about these things. And I'll just show a couple of slides. I want to talk to you without slides for a moment, but I'll show a couple of slides and, um, and then hand it off over to, to Cara Buckley, who I'm so excited to hear from too. It's really fun for me to share this space with her and have both of us talking because solutions journalism and um, the world of media and how the 24 7 media cycle perpetuates the negativity bias in our in our psyches that then creates a sense of reality that we're living in a story, a story of apocalypse. In fact, more Americans can imagine the apocalypse than they can imagine a post-fossil fuel society, which is a real sign that the radical imagination is totally depraved. And we have the media to blame for that, among many other things, including our climate educators. And so, you know, I'm really loving to think of Cara Buckley trying to push against that in her solutions work and her solutions journalism. And there's a lot of ways that uh, journalists are really trying to push against that um, because we're learning that that, that premise, again, the educator's premise and also journalistic premise and scientists premise too, is that if we just keep telling people how bad things are, they will figure out how to get their act together and change it and fix it. And it turns out, of course, that that's actually not, not the case. Um, so uh, just a couple of slides to sort of, sort of spin you through the, um, some of the stuff that I'm thinking about. I want to focus on my students because you all, many of you are students, college students, and um, one of the things that I, the sort of moment of epiphany where I, I thought I need to do something different was when I started to sort of document how my students felt, and it started to feel like a, like a, a, an emotional arc or journey that students were going through, and I could almost start to predict when students would fall off. And I have in all of my classes, I have a, exactly where in the semester students get so despairing with the content that they kind of drop off in a sort of story arc to the syllabus. And I'm trying to change that with my syllabus, and I'll explain to you a little bit about that. So what do my students feel? They feel that there's no good that they can do for the planet, only impact. And so environmental studies is often framed in terms of ecological impact. And most students feel like all of humanity Humanity, which is my next point, right? All of humanity is just having impact on nature and impact is bad. And so I, I like to think about, I started thinking about using Adrienne Marie Brown's work. I love Adrienne Marie Brown's book, Emergent Strategy. She's in everything I, I talk about where she asked, what would it take to thrive, to imagine thriving in a climate change future? And, and she asked us to think about feeding what we want to grow instead of only thinking about the negative. Is there positive impact? Can we think about all the ways that we are adding to the world? Is there a sense of abundance that can happen instead of the sense of scarcity and, sh and shutting myself down and becoming smaller and smaller and less and less? Um, how can we show up in a way that's really not just about bad impact, but positive impact? This particular one is really prevalent and most questions spin off of this one. The problems are too big and interconnected and people are too small and powerless to fix them. And I, could, I call this the apathy trap in my book, but Renee Lertzman and other psychologists write a lot about this. This is about a perception and a scale. And this is where humanities folks come in and think great critical thinking is really important for this. The, the sense that the problem is too big is a story we're told. And the sense that we have no power and we're too small to fix them is also a story we're told. 
we can simply live in different stories. There's lots of reasons to not think of the problem as too big. And there's lots of reasons to think of ourselves as having a lot of power. And I go into that at length in the book, but I just want to sort of tantalizingly throw that at you, that that's just a myth right there. Um, we're all past the point of no return. And this is the sort of idea of doomism. And this is, comes out of, of course, IPCC reports, which of course I love, but there's a sense of we've passed this point 10 years, this is it. After that, we all go to hell, right? This is sort of a, a deadline or inevitability narrative that I wanna push really back against and lots of really smart people are doing. I mentioned it's easier to imagine apocalypse. This is the work of Kari Norgard. Um, that's a real radical imagination problem that is no small matter. Um, young people, my students feel like their life course is unclear and that it won't be like previous generations. And so you see this in the protest signs of a lot of young people about not being able to um, retire off of the extraction of oil um, the way that their grandparents might have. Uh, many young people, this is becoming a really big story. Lots of people are talking about it, um, not wanting to have children and, and thinking it's cruel to bring children into this world. Students can't even show up for class, much less save the world. Um, there's a lot of ret resentment, betrayal, anger about the previous generations. There is a recent study that just came out with many of my colleagues out of the Lancet that I wanna to refer to here. Um, there's this Pew research that came out right out of the Lancet, but um, this Lancet study uh, surveyed 10,000 young people around the world and showed a bunch of data, including one out of four young people around the world doesn't wanna have a child because they're afraid to bring a child into the world. This is a very different reason to have, do reproductive refusal. Um, it used to be that there was sort of a zero population growth environmental argument to do that, that had all kinds of justice problems problems and, and, and feminists really point out a lot of problems to that. But now the desire to not reproduce has more to do with not wanting to have a child experience the planet that they're inheriting. 77% of youth across the globe say that the future is frightening. And this is a Lancet report. I highly recommend you look at the first and the largest uh, survey of its kind to put quantity and numbers behind the stuff that I was just feeling from my students and anecdotally writing about in my book. You know, now we've got this data, which is really frightening. Um, so I really want to point out the neuroscience of this, right? Like we can't just keep throwing chronic stress and instability at people and ourselves. And we can't just keep consuming this fire hose of doom because what it actually does is it blasts us out of our range of resilience or what some people call the window of tolerance and, and, and um, triggers our amygdala and our nervous system in such a way that I won't get into details, but it basically means that living out of that kind of chronic stress has physical and mental health uh, impacts to us that make us less and less able to actually address and mitigate climate change. And so there's a sort of feedback loop thing that happens where if, our, if we're constantly stressed about climate change, our bodies and our minds are not capable of actually doing the work to address climate change. So climate change really needs us to be mentally okay. And so there's a weird inherent paradox there. What can we do? What, what do we need to do to fix that? This is a little bit more detail around that. Climate, many people are documenting climate change's effects on mental health, which I bullet point just a few here. There's, there's studies coming out every, every day, it seems, seems like about another impact that climate change is on having on mental health. But what people are talking about much less, and I really wanna bring it up, is two things. One, that point I just made earlier, we need our mental health to address climate change. So we can't just let our mental health slip, right? There's sort of like a relationship there. And also, and mental health and physical health, as I mentioned a second ago with the neuroscience, are, are the, the, the chemistry and the hormones that happen because of, of, of chronic stress and trauma don't do our bodies any favors, right? That, those shorten our lives, literally. Um, and secondly, many of the things that climate change is doing to people in terms of mental and physical instability and threats is compounding existing sources of structural inequality like colonial colonial legacies, existing colonial uh, um, contexts, patriarchy, white supremacy, you know, you know, sort of a long, long um, legacies of slavery in the, in the U.S. context, especially these structural forms of oppression are just exacerbated by climate change. And so the psychological damage and trauma caused by those things, intergenerational trauma, are just made, made are compounded when we add climate change to the equation. Um, how does climate anxiety affect our ability to address climate change? Um, we live in stories that determine our actions. And so if we live in a story, psychologists have shown this, if we live in a story where we're in doom, we're actually going to engage less, which will then create a self-fulfilling prophecy and bring doom about. And so this is a real, the, the story we live in is critical to our future. 
Um, some key psychological terms for, for this question are the availability heuristic, which the availability heuristic is super interesting. We are more likely to believe something is gonna happen if we've seen the whatever the most recent image we can recall in our mind is about that thing. And that's why we can believe about apocalypse more than we can believe about fossil fuel future. Do we see any stories about the reality of a fossil fuel future that's utopic? No, we only see apocalypse, <laughs> right? So we're more likely to believe that that's actually true. This this is a real danger to our imagination and our inability to go back to the first point here of imagining a story where this unfolds in a positive way. Negativity bias is a tendency we have in our, uh, our reptilian brains to focus in on the negative as our protection from threats, which is awesome. But of course, in this particular moment, 24 hour news cycle, having constant threats and constant terrible things coming at us from all corners of the globe all the time, because the news media knows that it gets eyeballs if that's what it gives us creates a disbalanced sense of reality. Reality is not just that news cycle. So I'm really, really attentive to doom scrolling. And I refer people to all of the resources out there about the dangers of doom scrolling. The pseudo inefficacy effect is the idea that if a problem is really, really big and we don't think we can make an impact on it to solve it, we're not even likely to engage in it at all. And psychologists have described this and I welcome you to go look these up. With my limited time, I don't wanna to go too much into detail. It's super interesting tools for us to use to counter the, the despair and, and the inefficacy we might be feeling. Uh, a third issue that I, I write about in, in, um, in, my, in the Scientific American article that uh, caused a big splash among the trolls um, is that if we have big anxiety and emotional responses to the environment, um, it is very likely that people who have already some existing racist or xenophobic or nativist or authoritarian tendencies are likely to take climate change as another reason to have fear of the other and to participate in a long history of something that we have in the US, also was part of Nazi Germany. We see it in other places all the time of something called eco-fascism. So when you have big emotions around climate change, you've got people like the 2019 El Paso mass shooter or the 2019 Christchurch mass shooter who cited climate change as a reason for their mass atrocities. Um, and this has a long history uh, in US environmentalism that I, that I write about in my first book. Um, and I think it's really important for us to be wary of. Uh, what are the emotional tools we need? I love this quote by Gus Speth because so many people think that the only tools to address environmental problems and climate change are going to be technological or scientific. And so many students think they got to go into the sciences to go fix these problems. And as a person who's a humanist, I'm often saying, no, look at Gus Speth's quote. In fact, you know, all of these top environmental problems like biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change, 30 years of good science didn't solve these problems. These environmental problems are actually selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And scientists don't know how to do that. So scientists can take us so far. But when we have all these human dimensions to solving the problem, we need a whole lot of other toolkit. And so that's why I wrote my book. I wanted to, my purpose of writing my book was to say, there are things that environmental humanists are doing that can actually help that are not just psychologists. This is like basically critical thinking to the rescue. Um, and so I really felt like after the 2016 election, what was it in my tiny little sliver of expertise could I do in this moment to intervene in an emergency kind of a way? And then I saw so the book was a response to that. What do environmental humanities have to offer holding up the existential lives of the next sort of army of climate warriors that we need to make sure we're producing or else we're really all doomed? Um, Embracing life in the Anthropocene, getting schooled on the role of emotions in climate justice work. So here's where I look at the role of emotions in many social justice movements and why the climate movement needs to take, take note of those things. Um, cultivating climate wisdom, claim your calling and scale your action, hack the story, be less right and more in relation, ditching guilt, moving beyond hope and laughing more, resisting burnout and feed what you want to grow. And I want you to read the book, obviously, but I do have a little kind of like translated all the things into a checklist kind of thing. And this is my last slide. What can we do to cultivate resilience for climate justice? We need to be personally resourced. We need to have our cup be full. Otherwise, the neuroscience says that we can't actually weigh the pros and cons of any particular action. And we can't act in, in service of our mission and values. We're just reacting impulsively to the stimulus that comes at us in a state of fight, fight, or freeze doesn't do us any good, doesn't do the planet any good. 
Are we living in a story of resilience and hope and bending the arc towards justice, as Martin Luther King says? Or are we living in a story of decline, unraveling, and apocalypse? Again, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. We can choose to live in a different story. Are we aware that we are not acting alone, that we're surrounded and supported by community? And again, this is where a really strong critique of American individualism is critical, not just because that, that notion of pseudo inefficacy effect of I'm too small and the problem's too big, only in a world where we're acting as individuals. It only needs 25% of a collective to make a massive social cataclysmic change. And all the cataclysmic changes that ever happen are never just something, one little thing switching. It is always the groundswell work over years and years and years of untold, unnamed people who get things done. I mean, Greta Thunberg was just a, a, a you know, had a cataclysmic moment, but that was years and years and years of all kinds of generations of people working on climate change before that finally clicked. Are you visioning what you want, right? We can't just only visualize doom. We have to visualize the world that we want and we have to know what we're actually fighting for and we have to manifest it every little tiny space we can find it or else they've already won. Um, do you feel like you have some control over the condition of your life? So the definition of depression, the definition of bad mental health is not feeling like you have control of the conditions of your life. And capitalism wants everybody to not feel like they have control over the conditions of life. They want us to feel powerless over this. And so this is the first place to start. Where is the immediate space around me where I can just by one degree set a course slightly differently by one degree, because in the, you know 15 miles from now or 10 years from now, I'll be in a very, very different place. Even just by little degrees, we can make a big difference in our own lives. So that's it. I'll say thank you and pass it over. I hope I was in time. It's super hard in 20 minutes. I really, I speak quickly. So I hope that helps um, or not helps. These are the things that I'm up to. And I just, I really love Bea Kamalafe's uh, quote here. The times are urgent. Let us slow down. Um, take care of your amygdalas, people. The planet needs them. Thank you. That's it. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ray. That was really um, wonderful. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, hand things over now to Cara Buckley, and then we'll take questions for the both of you. So thanks. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, so nice to see you. Just at the time when my dog started barking, um, Sarah, it was great to hear you. Um, I wrote this, hope this, hopefully mine doesn't sound too, well, I'm a journalist and a writer after all, so bear with me. Um, as I tell you about my adventures through climate anxiety and how I began to find a solution for it. And I'll start with, um, so three, this is in my life, three times a day, every day, I go out hunting on the streets of Brooklyn, New York, where I live. And this is what I'm hunting for. And I always find plastic bags. Um, I need them because I have a dog and I want to be a good citizen and because as a reporter for the New York Times, it would be embarrassing to be caught breaking the city's pooper scooper laws. Um, I figure why buy doggy bags when there are free, one, free ones lying all over the place and I wear gloves, by the way, most of the time. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up at all is until quite recently, just seeing bags strewn all over the place like they always are in New York City, it would be enough to sort of tilt me into despair. Um, I'd imagine the life cycle of the bag, which is quite a bit longer than the life cycle of you and me. Um, the angst extended to pretty much every bit of plastic I came upon. If I saw a child's birthday balloon stuck in a tree, I'd imagine it stuck in a sea creature's gullet, its ribbon ensnaring sea turtles and birds. The angst in, in extended to insects. Um, once on an uptown train en route to a meeting at work, I saw a moth, a moth fluttering, fluttering about in a subway car, in the subway car I was in. And I was just thinking, oh my God, I must save it because of the insect apocalypse. And I carefully caught it in a cardigan, got off five stops early um, by City Hall where there was a little pocket park in lower Manhattan and set it free. And I was late for my meeting, but it was worth it in my view. Like I would have been haunted by the idea of this little moth for hours because, and it's sad underground fate. I was just so fixated. And this was only a few years ago and I don't fault my actions, but I was just sort of trapped in this prison of climate anxiety where I couldn't look anywhere and not feel despair. And I also didn't have a clue about how to deal with it. And so at that time, again, only a few years ago, I was working as a reporter in the New York Times culture section, 
which covers movies, music, and the arts. Um, as Evelyn mentioned, I've since changed gigs. Um, I've been with the paper since 2006, and it was just this past fall that I started this new job working on the climate desk. Um, so I'm just four months in, um, but it already feels like the best beat I've had yet. It's the one most aligned with my values and interests. And I bring this up because it was a really long time coming. I'm in my 22nd year of being a journalist, and um, it can really take a while to find your groove, not just with work or your passion, but also I think, and for me with engaging with this climate crisis, which was something I was just terrified to engage with and didn't know how to, because I was just so bloody anxious about it and justifiably so. Um, and along the way too, a bunch of doors got slammed in my face, by the way, which I'll talk about and which ended up being a good thing. So I never set out to be a climate reporter. Um, and as I haven't been one all that long, I wanna share a bit about the path that took me here. Um, my journalism career started in the year 2000. I was working at the Miami Herald, which is where I met Evelyn, um, who helped me retain my sanity because nothing about this pale, freckly Irish Canadian person belonged in Florida. But if being in Florida wasn't what I expected and certainly ever part of my plan, journalism wasn't exactly either. Um, you just never know where the next steps may be in your life. I know you're many of you are just sort of starting off in your professional careers. But after college, I spent a bunch of years, I was in Canada, I was waitressing and back waitressing in Canada, then I'd backpack around Guatemala and Mexico. And I spent uh, some time living in the jungles of Chiapas as a human rights observer. Then I went to graduate school at Columbia in the International Relations School studying human rights. Um, I also loved writing and I applied to the journalism school figuring I'm already here, they're gonna let me in for sure. I'll get a dual masters and then conquer the world somehow. And then uh, to my great shock, I did not get in. And um, so I was devastated and spent a few nights getting appropriately and blindingly drunk. And then when I awoke, I had this sort of hardened resolve I was driven by the fury of rejection and became dead set on actually making a career out of journalism. Um, I just point this out because sometimes setbacks in all, they can really be fuel, eco-friendly fuel. Um, there's a great quote by Samuel Beckett. Uh, he says, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. So I kind of sought out, went out seeking to fail to uh, fail better. Uh, so after the Times, after working at the Miami Herald, I started on the New York Times Metro desk. And as Evelyn mentioned, you know, I did a bunch of things, Hurricane Sandy, I went to ba Baghdad for a stint. And then in 2014, I moved to the arts section to cover the movie awards and Oscars race as a columnist. I didn't see it coming, but they offered it to me and I thought, eh. And so, there were substantive things I wrote about in this beat. There was issues of representation in Hollywood, um, Oscar's so white. I was one of the reporters that broke uh, the story about the comedian Louis C.K.'s sexual harassment of women. But even as I was in this world, there was this steady drumbeat of increasingly grim environmental news. And I felt increasingly at odds with my job. Um, and I can't pinpoint when exactly my despair about what we were doing to the planet came to the fore in my mind. But by 2015, it was kind of all I could think about. Like every unseasonably warm day, every photo of an emaciated polar bear, every grim report about another species gone and another on the brink, just I sunk deeper and deeper into despair. It was the only lens I had on the world and really disconnected me with the people around me because I couldn't understand how everyone wasn't talking about the climate crisis all the time. The sky was falling. I was wracked with guilt about living in a country in the global north that had such high emissions, that had such high waste per capita. Um, I steered every single conversation to the climate crisis. You got a new coat? Cool. Like fashion is one of the worst polluting industries. Like that baby mobile you die, you just bought will end up in a landfill for years. You know, I was Debbie Downer. Um, I remember I bumped into a neighbor. It was a really hot 
unseasonably hot day one April. And I was just saying, oh, God, the climate. And he said, yep, we've killed spring. And I just, I, was, I almost jumped into his arms. I was so excited to find somebody, a like-minded person. And, um, you know, at the time I was still covering Hollywood and I began to in ask interview subjects who just out of left field, like, how are you coping with all this climate stuff? Um, it, often it had nothing to do. I just was consumed. And um, the best answer came from the actress, Emma Thompson, who was involved with Extinction Rebellion. And she said, you know, it would help talking to young activists and get involved with the climate movement. But um, there's really strict ethics guidelines at the New York Times and I couldn't go to protests and I couldn't lobby. So I decided to see what I could do at work. And so even though I was on the arts section, I began looking at incorporating climate coverage. I wrote an article about how Hollywood was, was depicting climate change. And aside from a few documentaries, it was doing it pretty badly. Like it portrayed eco collapse as inevitable, like in Blade Runner movies. It portrayed like eco environmentalists as like eco terrorists, like <clears throat> Avengers Infinity War, like Thanos, the bad guy, wants to wipe out half of existence because intelligent species were consuming too many resources. Though <clears throat> I have to confess at the time, I was kind of on the side of Thanos. I went to Washington DC to profile the actress Jane Fonda, who was holding regular climate rallies at the Capitol and getting arrested. And I tried to do things in everyday life. And I mean, I look back and I think, Lordy, Lordy. I mean, I just, I was, I really felt like I had to do something. And I, I'm of the view that all the small things might not make a difference, but they'll make a difference to me as we obviously have to pursue the big things. So I started this thing at work. It feels so small, but I'm gonna tell you in the culture department called lug your mug. Like everyone bring your ceramic mug to work. So we stopped throwing out disposable paper coffee cups. And um, I was in this very puritanical mindset at the time. So it often resulted in me like shooting these really dirty judgmental looks at the editors and writers who would still use the disposable coffee cups around me. They would sort of scurry out of the pantry, avoiding my eyes, you know, with their paper cups. I mean, it was, so none of this for me was enough. And um, of course at the New York times, there's a climate desk. Um, but at the time I didn't have much experience writing about science. And I also didn't want to report on bad climate news all the time. It was already such a preoccupation for me and making it a full-time job as well seemed like a bad idea. Also, to be honest, uh, shockingly, the climate editors weren't clamoring to bring the Oscar reporters on board. Um, and so, God, well, this is, anyway, this is my personal experience. So I'm keeping it quite narrowly focused, but, um, I ended up pitching a story to an editor at the paper who I also knew was preoccupied about the climate crisis. He led the style section and I wanted to write a story about my efforts to find a way to deal with my climate grief. Um, he liked the idea, he gave me the green light and I went to a workshop based on the amazing work of the climate grief pioneer. Her name is Joanna Macy, she's out there in Berkeley. I interviewed climate and eco psychologists and First Nations activists. I was to glean tips about dealing with climate angst. Um, the remedies that resonated with me the most came from former climate activists who had left environmentalist environmentalism burned out and heartbroken. And they found their way back after doing spiritual work, oftentimes Buddhist, Buddhist sort of practices, which Joanna Macy incorporates as well. Um, and they mirror the ideas that Sarah writes about in her book. Um, some of them for me were things like incorporate your response to the crisis into your everyday life. Like eat, for me, that means like eating vegan or picking up my plastic bags, you know, find a way to work towards a solution, but try and let go of fixed results. Um, learn to feel pain without getting paralyzed by it and express gratitude. Um, the, the climate and eco psychologist told me that feeling angry and sad about the planet is actually the perfectly natural sane response, but that feeling that all the time and being basically a self-hating human, which I kind of was, it doesn't help anyone or anything. 
and it burns out our circuitry. Um, I also resonated with the work of this woman named Toni Spencer, who is an English educator and activist who said that expressing gratitude about what we love most, assuming that what we love most isn't like a handbag or a car, it helps unravel us from the consumption that we're told is the most important thing. It helps us disentangle from what we've been told that we should need and what we lack. So what she was saying, in other words, was that gratitude for what we have help break, help, helps break the spell of more, more, more and disrupts this addiction to distraction and disposability that sort of helped drive us to this precipice in the first place. She calls it the politicization, politicization of gratitude. And I also got a lot of comfort from talking to an eco-psychologist named Zua Woodbury, who told me, he said, all this news, including by your paper, by the way, he was saying to me about planetary ruination, it's traumatizing. You have to limit your exposure to it. So I work at a newspaper that does this, but I began to heed that and limit my exposure to it. So anyway, I write all this up in my piece, twice as long as what it was supposed to be. I was still kind of proud, like I've never written anything so personal. I send it off to the styles editor. I wait, crickets. I wait, crickets. He gets back to me. He's not going to run it. He's he says, oh, it's too much first person and the ending doesn't really work. And uh and so then he says, take it to the opinion section. And I later learned that several top editors at the police they, there, they thought the piece was too overwrought. Like my exploration of my grief over planetary apocalypse was apparently too emotional, God forbid. But a, a young editor in the section there uh, really liked it. He chopped the piece in half. He ran it. And um, I ended up hearing from readers all over the world who said they felt paralyzed by cl climate grief as well and hadn't realized that other people felt the same. And for me, that connection was bomb. And um, I actually was approached, this is late 2019, to write a book about dealing with climate grief. And then the planet, the, the planet, the pandemics was happened and those plans were scuttled. And I'm actually quite glad about that because I really, I mean, I, I'm not just saying this because Sarah is a co-presenter, but I can't imagine writing anything better than her amazing book, which I've already sent to a colleague. Okay. So this, sorry, brings me at long last. Thank you for hanging in with me to my current job reporting on the climate desk. So last summer I pitched an idea to a few top editors. Um, you know, it's, I mean, I don't need to tell you the planetary news keeps getting worse and worse. And, um, Inside the paper and outside, awareness and justifiable alarm over the climate crisis, it had never been greater. And what I really wanted to do for my own, you know, it was honestly selfish reasons as well, was focus on people working towards solutions in their everyday lives. I wanted to focus on stories that offered pinpricks of light and amid an increasingly dark, okay, doomer narrative. And, um, Finally, my timing was right. And um, within a month of making my pitch, I started the new job. So very new in this. So one of my stories was about Carmel, Indiana, which is has more traffic roundabouts than anywhere else in America. Roundabouts are the safest and most sustainable and resilient types of intersections around. Another is about a new solar farm going in on top of a shuttered coal mine in Appalachia, a project that has the support of former coal miners there. And the story that got the most response so far, and again, I'm only at the beginning, was about a Catholic ecologist out on Long Island who had gotten rid of his lawn and over the decades filled it with native plants for pollinators and birds. And I just happened to be staying with a friend out there and walked by and saw it. And I thought they're never gonna run this story in the New York Times because everyone's written about pollinator gardens. So what, it's a newspaper and this isn't news, but it was a very personal story of hope and um, it ended up getting something like 700,000 page views. I don't know how many were from the ecologist himself clicking on it in delight, but anyway, and 1400 reader comments. But, but what the success of the story made us realize was how hungry people are for good news about the planet, how eager they are to learn about what they themselves can do in their everyday lives to help preserve and create ecosystems and also help the lives of the other creatures we share this gorgeous planet with. And so this brings me to the flip side of being at this kind of terrible 
crucial moment in history. More people than ever are aware of this crisis, more people than ever want to do something about it. Sarah talks about this in her book. And there are more ways than ever to engage with it. And so for me, from the moment I started this new job, my paralyzing, paralyzing anxiety over the climate shrank drastically. It's not gone, it can still flare up, but even just writing about people who are working towards solutions and there are so many and so many levels and um, it isn't just helpful for readers, but it's just, it's been amazingly helpful to me. And then bringing this full circle, like nowadays when I go out walking the dog and I see one of those pl a plastic bag drifting along the sidewalk, wrapped around a lamppost, stuck in a tree pit, I just think, okay, it's just a bag. It's a free poop bag. And rather than using it to like, go like, think of it as yet another sign of planetary apocalypse. Um, I don't wait. I used to wait until other people were out of sight before picking it up and be embarrassed about it. And no one's looking at me. Um, everyone's looking at their phones anyway and paying no attention. I'm also hidden behind my mask, but sorry to be cheesy, but this is sort of how I've learned to cope with my planet anxiety. One, by having the enormous luck to work at a job focusing on climate solutions and also by becoming kind of a local bag lady. So thank you guys very much for listening. I'm so delighted to be speaking here. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Kara, um, for, for sharing all of that with us. Um, so I'm now going to um, turn things over to um, my colleague, Mona Singer, who is going to help us um, kind of take on the Q&A. Um, so obviously students, if you and folks in the audience, whether they're students or not, actually, um, if you have questions, please feel free to use the raise hand function. I'm now gonna go in and allow um, people to unmute themselves to ask questions. And then you can also, of course, use the chat. So, Give me one second to let people unmute themselves. Yes, you should be able to do that now. Um, and we'll go ahead and uh, Dr. Zimar, I'll let you take it away. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I mentioned to students before our two fabulous talks began, if you could please make sure to type in um, the name of your class so that we know where you're coming from um, if you want to submit a question in the chat. Um, and if you're raising your hands, maybe you can also share which class you are from. Um, and I know that for at least one of our classes, we have some uh, questions that students have prepared beforehand. So we'll try to work those in too. But um, Kaden, I see that you have your hand up. So why don't we start off with you? Uh, so I'm from Professor McDonald's nature writing class. I was just wondering a question more specifically for Ms. Buckley, although Ms. Ray can also share in on it is how do you like tread that line? So you said they said your piece was overwrought. What kind of things do you think are too alarmist and what kind of things do you think are more hopeful? I know you talked about pollinator gardens and I think that's a perfect vignette almost into the environmental crisis and how to navigate it. But like, what kind of process do you have in your thoughts about like taking things out and leaving things in that are not too alarmist, but still encouraging? So for me, you know, it's all in the reporting. So, so in the pollinator garden story, it was all in, I tried to bring less of myself in and more of what the, this Catholic ecologist was telling me about his belief in God and the natural world. So it was all channeling him and he has really worked to focus not on the doom, but on how he has counteracted it by growing all these flowers and drawing all these insects and you know, trying to convince other neighbors. So it's really sort of getting myself out of the way. And be, and that's just one of the things, like the joys of being a reporter is you can kind of disappear into other people's lives. And I just try and parse away all the stuff I'm bringing in, all the baggage of like, oh my God, <laughs> like we're so screwed. And just, you know, go into the story of what these people who are offering solutions are doing. So I keep it, in that case, it was hyper, hyper specific. Thank you. Um, I think we may have a, a question from Dr. Woodson Bolton, who's gonna be asking one on behalf of one or more of her students. 
Uh, yeah, great. Thank you so much um, to both speakers. This has been so great. And um, my students read some of your uh, some of your work. So I see Zoe posted one question. So maybe let's start with that. She posted this in the chat. Um, she says, you write that urgency driven by fear can make us do impulsive, irrational things. This is Professor Ray. Um, how can we balance the need for immediate climate action with the importance of careful planning, which is a great question. Yeah, um, I think that there's no one answer to that. I don't mean to take the easy, the easy way out of that question. Um, this, the answer to that question is going to be different for every person. Um, we all have a different mental health profile and we all have different things going on in our lives. And climate action is, looks really different for different people. And I often think about um, Timothy Morton's brilliant analogy of climate change as a, what he calls a hyper object. And you might have noticed that Don't Look Up was done by hyper object films. And <laughs> this is an idea that's out there, you know, um, look it up, it's interesting. But the idea of a hyper, hyper object like climate change is that it's so dispersed that it, and dispersed across time and space that it's almost imperceptible. And it's kind of like a whack-a-mole, like it shows up in weird places where it's not, doesn't seem relevant, like, I don't know, a pandemic. Um, and so there, the idea of, you know, the metaphor of other or the parable of like the, the blind people touching the elephant is appropriate here in that many people think about, you know, I, I want to fix climate, but I don't even know how to begin. Only the scientists or some people in higher positions of power, if you have a lot of money, can you fix it? Only, only Elon Musk taking us to Mars is going to fix it. And in fact, that's really a dangerous way of thinking about it. Um, addressing climate change is going to have to be everywhere. Project Drawdown talks about every job, a climate job. We're going to need to bring this passion and this stamina for long-term engagement, what I call resilience, climate resilience, into everything we do. And the very fact, Robert Bullard, the grandfather of environmental justice in the U.S. context, he said that environmental justice is a marathon, not a sprint. I even like to push it a little further and say it's a, a relay marathon um, to mix all the metaphors. But um, you know, we're, we're in this in a group together when we like in a choir decide that we need to take a breath to get more breath to keep singing, the song doesn't stop. There is this army of people out there, what Paul Hawken calls the blessed unrest. Um, Emergent resilience, uh, David Marie Brown's book thinks of it as a rhizome. There's a rhizomatic grassroots movement that's all building towards this. And we simply put, we're simply not alone in doing this work. And so therefore the urgency is not, is not, um, yeah, we have to hurry up to slow down, right? I mean, or slow down to hurry up, whatever you wanna think of it. The urgency tends to make us act out of an impulsive place, which often is just to deal with the immediate threat in front of us, which usually is a negative feeling of fear, which is our body telling us something bad is around us, not usually thought through, not usually tapped into our prefrontal cortex to make a wise decision. And that tends to mean that we're burning out our energy on something that's maybe not actually very effective. So the time that it takes to sit back Take the pause between stimulus and response, as Viktor Frankl beautifully put it, between, between stimulus and response is a pause, and that's where we have power and control over our lives and choice. And in that space, we work with our communities, we sit back and discuss, we take the time it is required to come to our, our problems wise with wisdom and, and, and wisely and skillfully. And then we can make sure that the actions that we're doing are in alignment with what we're trying to achieve, they're in alignment with our values and not just coming out of reactivity. And we have to assume that everybody else that's working on this stuff is doing that as quickly as they can too. And we simply have to realize that we are gonna have this challenge for the rest of our lives. This is not something that once we achieve something, we can live in utopia, sit back, relax, have our margaritas on a beach and enjoy uh, the planet being fabulous. This is, this is not the way it's gonna go down. And so do we, we and the planet have this one option, which is that we have to be in this for the long haul. So the question is, how are you gonna do that? And I think Kara has put it beautifully. She's just told us the whole story of how she got to a place where she had to realize she can't live like this. What's she gonna do? What are the options? And urgency is a, a recipe for burnout. A second point about urgency is it's also really bad for social justice. And so you have a lot of people at the sort of upper end of climate, the climate movement, who've used the urgency of climate movement as an excuse to not include a lot of voices at the table. You know, you hear this all the time, or sort of like national security, like it's, it's a matter of national security. We can't have civil liberties, right? Like there's this kind of like excuse of urgency as a way to um, 
to, to um, reinforce the status quo or serve the existing powers that be. And um, many people, I, th I think of the work here of Kyle Powis White, who's a Potawatomi climate philosopher at Michigan. He's written a lot about a critique of urgency as being really fundamentally at odds with indigenous sovereignty and, and social justice. And so I really, I really um, urge us away from urgency. Yeah, ur I urgently urge us away from urgency. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Kara, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? I don't think there's anything I can add to that. Not even if even if I would, <laughs> if I would like to, I can't. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, you know, Chase, let's uh, let's hear from you. So Chase is from um, my Sustainable Cities class. Please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so my question was for Dr. Ray. Um, and on the slide where you were talking about your exist existential toolkit for the climate generation, the seventh point that you brought up is uh, ditch guilt, move beyond hope and laugh more. Um, and I know you mentioned not wanting to get too much into your book, but um, I, I had a question because when you say ditch guilt, do you mean not looking introspectively as to what I can do better because of how, like as, in, as individuals, our impact isn't as big as we'd like it to be? Or, or could you just elaborate more for me? I love it. Um, yeah, so I think that most of the environmental movement from the 70s onward has been operating from a politics of guilt, right? Like, this is the impact you're having, refrain from consumption, you know, do make these lifestyle choices, you're pervasively complicit. And then we have the ecological footprint exercise and BP trying to individualize the problem onto people's individual selves, which has led to us all feeling totally powerless to address this problem. So guilt as a sort of politics is a really ineffectual politics. And the people who have done the best work on guilt are actually a critical race theorists who've talked about white guilt and how it's actually a very conservative emotion. And people have studied how guilt the thing about guilt is that most people just want to not feel guilt. It's an aversive, afflictive feeling, as Buddhists would call it. And right there with Karakara, like, yeah, I went down the Buddhist track. That's exactly where I'm at. You know, like, that's an afflictive emotion. And what people normally do with guilt is they just try to move away from it. What's making them feel guilty is structural problems that they may have some complicity in, and they need to do that investigative work like you just mentioned, right? They need to look inward and say, how am I complicit? How can I do less harm? What, what do I need to do? But guilt actually doesn't make them stop those behaviors. It turns out guilt makes me people just move away from evidence that, that should make them feel guilty. And so that doesn't structurally change anything. That doesn't engage activism. That doesn't, that's just a, I don't like this feeling. I'm gonna move over here and denial might be a better place to be. Um, it, it, it creates a cognitive dissonance that um, you, you're behaving one way, but you're feeling another way. And that feels like a split. And rather than investigate it, people usually just move away from it. And so the studies that people have done on guilt um, suggest that guilt is just a not, not an effective emotion for long-term engagement. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do that in our, in our work to figure out what am I doing that, can I, that I can do better? You know, how can I examine myself and unpack myself and figure out what, how am I participating in the systems I don't agree with? That's a different matter, but that doesn't require guilt. I mean, I, I, I invite you all to, to think about, can we do that without guilt? Um, I have... I have maybe a little bit of a follow-up question um, related to that topic. Uh, and I'm gonna skip around a little bit because part of what we'd like to do here is make sure that we hear from students from all of the classes. And um, Anastasia from Professor Zink's class asked um, a few questions down in the chat. Do you think it will be possible to work on real global change if we as a society let go of the shame and denial revolving around eco-despair? Would we be able to implement actual effective changes in government regulations as well as our day-to-day -day lives? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass this one to Cara because I think I've spoken the last two questions. I'd love to hear Cara's thoughts. <laughs> Can I hear it one more time? It's, I've, I've been out of academia for a while and my brain is like- <laughs> Sure, sure. So, you know, um, Actually, there are a couple of questions throughout the chat and that I've received um, from, from students or faculty that revolve around this idea of um, how to let go of shame and let go um, of those negative emotions. And if that 
would help in some way, shape, or form, both with personal action and changing policy? I mean, I would hope so. I, I feel like personal action can lead to policy because if you're doing something in your life and you feel empowered by it, you can therefore build up enough to do others. Like for me, it I had to sort of step out of what seemed like and what the this Buddhist called out, it was like this lapsed Catholic, like mea culpa, mea culpa thing. It wasn't our fault, weirdly. You know, we didn't. I didn't create plastic. I, you know, wasn't part of the plastic manufacturing association that taught everybody to throw stuff out instead of, you know, reusing everything. I mean, people don't jump into their cars meaning to trash the planet, you know, most for the most part. And it's ultimately paralyzing. And so if you sort of don't believe if you just try and step away from the pain of that all and just sort of harness your what you can into what you can do sarah has been talking about this as well a lot and much more eloquently than i can but for me it was taking the action that helped allay the guilt a little bit and then doing something a little bigger like working on the climate desk covering solutions that helped allay the, it was like where am i focusing that old thing of which wolf are you going to feed and just sort of giving other people a bit of a break and not always just sitting there going you mother effer with your plastic water bottle like just always being this, this hyper vigilant ultimately exhaustive exhausting for me place like that's what helped whether that can influence policy, I mean, I think so. I mean, the people, again, who I look to, who've been able to, they, they've, it's, you know, it's like slow and steady, slow and steady, and being able to not burn out on these really scary, okay, doomer, we're terrible, we're the worst species ever, which I do lapse into every now and then, but you can't stay there and be effective. There's just no way, you know, you can stay there and hate everybody and, you know, just sort of be, think nihilistically, but that's not going to help you or anyone else. Thank you. Uh, Garrett, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, my, um, my question is actually a lot about this, um, okay, Doomer perspective Sorry. that you're talking about. Um, I find that very interesting and kind of reson resonates with me. Um, my question is more about like how to how can you express the urgency of climate change to others? Um, because often like these types of reading and this discourse is really only going to reach the people who are open and willing to understand this. Um, but it's very necessary, at least in my opinion, to like create more of a paradigm shift as a whole for everyone. So how how can we reach those people who are unwilling to hear this, but it's so necessary that they hear this kind of stuff, but not from a doomsday perspective, if that makes sense. So are you, I'll, I'm just gonna jump in. Garrett, do you have like people like that in your everyday life or are you thinking more large scale? Yeah, um, I'm from Idaho, if that means anything. So I, I do run into a lot of that. Right. Sarah, do you want, I haven't been, I'm a Canadian. I, I'm going to go to the Midwest as part of my further <laughs> reporting. But, but, you know, I will say that, and, you know, Sarah, again, Sarah brought this up in her book and this has been written about, there are people, you know, if you just take out the word climate change or climate crisis, there's people everywhere who, the major, vast majority of people in this country are worried about what's happening with the climate. They might just not use that exact vocabulary. I think it's finding the way in. Like, are you worried about the drought? Are you worried? Like, what do you think about the unseasonable X, Y, or Z? Sarah, jump in at any point. But like, to me, there are ways around it of just also listening. So again, I've done all of four stories in my new job as a climate reporter. But when I went to Appalachia to write about this solar farm in Eastern Kentucky and talk to you know, really struggling people there, never expecting. I would hear former coal miners say, we need any jobs, a solar farm, even if it's gonna be temporary is great. And then another coal 
former coal miner saying, and it'll help with climate change. What? You know, it was, it was in me listening that I kind of learned that, wait a minute, this is way, I went in with all my ideas, Appalachia, you know, da, 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 it's bordering West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And just by sort of opening up that space, I was ha very happily proven wrong. I love everything Kara said. I, I agree with all of that. Um, the, the science on, there's a lot of people studying this here. And um, the field of climate communication is the place where all the most cutting edge studies are happening around this question. You've got people like Catherine Hayhoe in her new book. Um, can you remember her book name? Um, but she's an evangelical climate scientist who has made a career out of her ability to go into really hostile spaces and, and have these conversations and talk about and write about the craft and the art of, of climate communication. Um, and then there's somebody else who Faith Kearns just wrote a book called The Science, the, um, Getting to the Heart of, of Science Communication, who's written the same kinds of stuff. What Cara said about using other vocabulary is absolutely right. The politics of outrage that divide us right now never works. Righteousness is not a mode that changes people's minds. Um, and so I have a chapter, um, a cha one of my chapters that I mentioned is Be Less Right and More in Relation. And that chapter is where I talk about the, the strategies that these scientists who study this recommend for changing people's minds and the paradigm shift you're talking about. And so there's, there's some really good evidence out there about this. The main punchline though, is that people will change their mind. Okay, what's the question is, how do you get people to change their mind? Okay, well, outrage and, and righteousness don't tend to do it. So what does do it? It tends to be that people will change their mind if a trusted interlocutor, meaning the messenger, is starting to say something. The pressure or the changing of what their neighbors are doing or their weather person on their local channel or someone down at the store, or if their neighbor puts up a sign that says something, or if a neighbor, turns out people are much more likely to get solar panels on, I mean, not that solar panels are the be all end all testament to environmental behavior, but this, they've done studies on this, that if people are getting different kinds of things around the neighborhood, that changes neighborhood behavior way more than politics. We are not actually rational creatures. And so trying to use reason to get me or anybody to change their mind about something turns out not to work. But if your neighbor is doing something, your weather person on your, your local channel is doing something, the guy down at the comedian store is saying something, you are way more likely to, to, to change your mind. And so how do we either make better messengers or use the messengers that exist more effectively? The Yale Climate Center um, people did a research project a while ago where they uh, enlisted a ton of weather people to start integrating climate change into their into their weather reports and local channels, and it turned they had way more effect of getting people to change their politics on climate change than any other climate communication effort. You can't even expect people to change their politics on climate change because they're feeling climate change. People in California feeling fires, and this is the same in Idaho, are not more likely to change their views or politics on climate change. They actually have to also have a story that is consistent with the rest of their sense of self and identity. Um, sometimes that just doesn't use the word climate change, but Kara's point about the vast majority, 70% of Americans are somewhat concerned about climate change. And then within that, there's something like 40% are very concerned and 20% are alarmed. This is, a, this is a workable number. And with those kinds of numbers, I have sort of myself um, decided that it's less important to me to work on getting people to change their minds and more important to work on the swath of people who care so much but don't know what to do or feel powerless. That swath feels much more in need of something. Um, and those are some of the questions that are being asked. But in Idaho, yeah, you're up against something. I mean, I have a lot of colleagues in Idaho. I work with people in Idaho. And that is a whole different, that, that is a whole thing. And the research, the person I love who's working in Idaho, his name is Jennifer Ladino. And she's doing a lot of work on climate emotions in Idaho. And she's written um, about the emotion of guilt and anger. And it turns out guilt for her students works really effectively. So this goes back to the, the, my other critique of guilt. She says, this is really effective to get people to go from one position to another. And we saw that with people like um, Greta Thunberg get using guilt as a, as a persuasive technique in Davos, right? I mean, guilt does get people to budge sometimes. So when you're in that level of opposition, sometimes you can leverage different um, persuasive tools um, to more effect. Thank you, that was a great question and two really, really helpful responses. Um, thank you. 
Um, so that was Garrett from my Sustainable Cities class. And um, there's a question from Dr. McDonald's nature writing class um, that Anthony put into the chat. And I see you also have your hand up, Anthony. Do you wanna read or paraphrase your question um, that you addressed both to Dr. Ray and to Ms. Buckley? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my question was basically, what are some pieces of advice and encouragement, I guess, that you would give younger generations when it comes to realistically actionable plans for them to effectively participate in kind of mitigation efforts regarding the climate crisis while also prioritizing, as you guys were talking about, their own mental health? I'm sorry if that's too broad, but... No. I don't think those two things are, in my opinion, mutually exclusive at all. Like, I mean, really going local and, you know, what Sarah's also talked about, like building, building resiliency by building community um, is very, very helpful. You know, a friend of mine, all of his community garden stuff helps him not go completely off the deep end <laughs> um, around this. And you know, it's, it sounds small, but it, it isn't a small thing. Like there's community gardening, there's, you know, it's like, it's urban fruits and vegetables for people in the neighborhood. And, you know, that helps him mentally almost more than anything. It certainly helps him more than doom scrolling through social media. You know what I mean? So for me, there's really a, a big connection between those two things. Yeah, I love that, Kara. You made me think of a few more things too. Um, in my book, I talk about less stick and more carrot. And Adrian Marie Brown talks about feeding what you want to grow. And this refers to Kara's point about which wolf do you want to feed. Um, there is There are lots of wisdom traditions that talk about where, whatever we put our attention to. And neuroscience backs us up with neural pathways and, and cognitive behavioral therapy um, is based on this premise that what, it, what we put attention to, what we put our mind on is what becomes more real and therefore more true and bigger in our lives. And in fact, material in, in outside of us, it actually also becomes bigger because we make an impact on the world, right? So if what we wanna make an impact on is we want the apocalypse to continue to scare us into apathy and denial and despair, just keep paying attention to the apocalypse. If we want, to pay it, if we want what to grow our, our local gardens, our community resilience, um, our family health, um, you know, getting bikes more in the streets, making more green spaces accessible to more people. We just get plugged into all those communities doing that and those things increase. They're like, it's like any kind of plant in a garden, whichever ones you wanna grow, you put the fertilizer, the sunlight and the water on and it grows. And the same is true for neural pathways and, and actual reality in life. So absolutely what Kara said, these two things are not mutually exclusive they are totally connected because of that. Um, and the, you know, it, it takes a discipline to do that. And I, I, it's interesting that most climate anxiety and climate movement people, for the most part, are operating in this place of a lot of stick, doom scrolling, mea culpa, that Cara mentioned, guilt, dep deprivation, minimalism. I mean, I'm all for all these things, but, you know, and I, most people don't continue to come back for that kind of thing. Most people go back where their dopamine gets triggered and it feels good. Uh, unfortunately, we're just like any other kind of animal. We like that, just like the rats do. And so, you know, mostly when we feel bad, we'll tend to go somewhere into some sort of denial or numbing to get away from that and get some dopamine hits. And so what we ought to be doing is instead of just quickly going to our phones and scrolling our way away from feeling bad, we ought to plant some seeds in our life that actually grow stuff that actually fulfills us so we don't feel the need to go numb ourselves. If we live in a world that we actually want to live in, then we're not going to feel so despairing. It's just simply the reality of it. Oh, it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rachel, looking at what time it is, uh, do you think we have time for one more question or would you like to close us, make a remark? Um, I don't know, I hate to close things off. I don't know if we have a really quick question, but we do have just like one minute left before this um, class period ends and people might need to get to other classes. I see Rodrigo has um, his or their hand up. I'm, I don't know if you have a really fast one, but. 
It was just talking about just talking about the mental health and the cognitive reappraisal and appraisal strategies dealing with mental health and the environmental issue. Do you think in order to start as a platform, should we merge the fields of psychology and environmental sciences together? That way we can help build these seeds for the future in the academic setting and then transition these programs into like city councils. That way we don't have the doomsday perspective, but a more um, intellectual way of viewing sustainable development in cities. Yes. You asked for a quick question and that's a yes or no one and I'm gonna go with yes. <laughs> Great. All right, well, thank you so much um, to our two presenters today. It's um, really been a pleasure um, to hear from you and thank you for taking time to join us um, this afternoon or this evening um, as Cara's case might be. Um, thanks for all of our students and other uh, you know, guests who joined us today to hear about this. Um, we appreciate your time and attention. Before we close out, I just want to note that next week um, on Tuesday, or excuse me, Wednesday, we'll be hearing from Dr. Nadia Kim at LMU. Um, her talk is called Refusing Death, How Asian and Latina Immigrant Women Fight for Environmental Justice in Los Angeles. Um, so that will be next Wednesday. Um, with that, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon or evening, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thank everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rachel. Do, do you need us for anything for me? And I don't. I, I don't think so. Thanks so much, Sarah. Yeah. Um, thanks again for joining us. I hope you have oh, a great afternoon. You. That was great. I love how you organized all the students to come. That was fantastic. So yeah. really, that was great. Yeah, great.